Everybody doing all right this morning? So uh, look to your neighbor and ask them if their team won yesterday. You know, college football's back. So, so hopefully if you're a Georgia fan and Alabama fan, which I think makes up at least like 80% of the church, any, anybody not Georgia or Alabama got another team? Who's your team? Oh, goodness. Tonight, tonight. I'm, I'm predicting a Florida State upset, so <laughs> I'm just kidding. We'll see. We'll see. But uh, it is good for college football to be back. All I'm saying is Georgia played a ranked team. Alabama played a high school team, so that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, I'm just saying. But, hey, it is it's good to be in church today and uh, just excited uh, that you're all here. I just want to real quick, before we get into the message, can we just shout out this incredible worship team just for all that they do and how they just constantly pour it out in service each and every week. I mean, it, it was just amazing. I mean, that last song, like, man, Miss Katie's over here, like, they're singing the running after me. Miss Katie's pulling out this number, like, she's, like, running after the goodness of God, or, like, the goodness of God running after her. I don't know. It was amazing, though. And just uh, the obedience of this worship team and all that they do, just, you guys are amazing. Give them one more hand for just how awesome they are. Well, man, it is, uh, it is awesome to be up here bringing this last week of this incredible series that we've been in, Vertical. Say Vertical. And uh, just to be able to, to just kind of cap it off uh, as our pastors are, are leading the marriage retreat, um, which, you know, all of us, our marriages are good. That's why we're not there. So we're, we're good. So way to go. Um, you don't need it, no. But, <laughs> uh, but listen, healthier marriages equal healthier churches. So uh, I'm so thankful for them. And, and then our founding pastors are there too, investing in these, I think it's like 15 couples or something. It's a, it's a, a solid number. So uh, excited about that. I know it's going to make our church better. But we're going to get into this last week of vertical. And all month long, we've been talking about just really the glory of God. You know, the vertical relationship we have with God that we get to partake in his glory and and experience it every single day. We've been talking about, you know, how, how we do that, how desperately we need the presence of God. And then last week and then today, we've been talking about, you know, how does that affect our horizontal relationships? You know, last week, Pastor Michael brought an incredible message on worship uh, and just how we walk that out day in and day out, that we are, are called to worship God because he's so good, not because of what he's done, but simply just because of who he is. Listen, we, if God never did another thing for us, he sent Jesus, what more do we need? And so, so, so we worship him for all that he does and for who he is. And then today, I want to talk about what it looks like to take this glory public and share the message of Jesus everywhere we go with everyone that we encounter. Because you understand, as Christians, that's our call. It doesn't matter your background, your personality. You know, if, if you feel up to the task, I guess, you know, to, to share, you say, well, you know, that's, I'll leave that to the social people. That's not so much for me. Listen, if you call Jesus Lord, you are called to be an evangelist. You are called to take him with you everywhere you go, not just on Sunday mornings where it's easy or on Wednesday nights or in your, in your church group, your prayer group, you know, whatever it is. It, it's easy to do it in those places, but I'm talking about in your, in your schools, in your job, in your families even sometimes, at the grocery store, at the ballpark, wherever it is you go, you can be a carrier of the glory of God and other people can experience his glory because of you. Because you're just simply obedient. You say yes to being a vessel of, of who God is, and he wants to use you to take his message out into the world. See, listen, we are the church. The Bible calls us the hope of the world. And so if we would just step up to the plate and just be okay with, with feeling uncomfortable sometimes if it means that somebody else experiences God's glory. That is what we have been called to. And so we, I want to talk to us today about what it looks like to just be public and be, be open about this. Here's what I want us to get is that clear and direct witness to others about my relationship with Jesus Christ brings the glory down. Listen, his glory, Jesus doesn't need more glory, okay? He is, he is just as full of glory as he will ever be. And so it's not about us, you know, bringing it to him, but, but really what it is is that we're just helping other people know how full of glory he really is. And when we, when we are clear and we, we are not ashamed and we don't let obstacles get in the way of our declaring the glory of God, then it brings his glory down to earth. Because listen, there's glory up in the heavens right now. Can I just tell you that there is always a party going on in heaven because Jesus is there, because he reigns, because of what he, he did, and because God the Father, right, you know, 
He, listen, there is glory constantly going on, a constant parade of glory in heaven. But when we witness to other people about who he is, it brings the glory down. It brings it into our homes, into our communities, into our workplaces, into the, the public places that we occupy. When we witness and we are bold, and we're going to talk a lot about that word today, boldness. When we are clear and we, and we just simply live as vessels of his glory, it brings the glory into everyone else's lives that we, we get to to touch, we get to reach. And what an honor that that is that he chooses us to do it. Listen, I know me, you know you, and sometimes we don't get it right, we don't say the right thing, we mess up, we fall short, but yet he still chooses to use you and I to establish his glory on the earth. Come on, that's worth getting excited about, that we get to be partakers and distributors of the glory of God. I want us to go to 2 Corinthians, this is where we're going to be camping out today, 2 Corinthians 2 verses 14 through 17. If you don't have it, it'll be on the screen behind me. But let's read this, what Paul has to say. It says, But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. If that, if just an easier way of saying that, in a parade, in a constant glory parade. And through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God. You smell like Jesus. Among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one a fragrance from death to death and the other a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity as commissioned by God, in the sight of God we speak in Christ. So we're going to break this down kind of as, as we go along. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but, but basically what he's saying is that we are called, we are commissioned in the mission that Jesus established. You know, what he said before he went to heaven is called the great what? commission, right? And what he said is, hey, you go out and make disciples of all nations, all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to be with you as you do it. And I mean, what a great hope. I'm glad we're not doing it, you know, without him. I, I couldn't do it without him. I need his presence with me as I witness to people. But what he's saying, what Paul is making us aware of here is that, listen, to some people, you're going you're gonna to be like this good smell. I love how he just compares it to like a good smell. You know, like you know, whatever your favorite smell is, you think of that. But, but just like it's something that when, you're, when you become aware of it, it's just like this good feeling like, wow, that's something I want to be around. And then, but listen, he also tells us, and this is what we don't like to hear, is that to some people... When you're a carrier of the glory of God and you witness to other people, you're going to smell like death to some people. Nobody wants to hear that. It's like, no, I want to be a, a pleasant smell to everyone that I encounter. But listen, there's going to be people that you witness to, and this is our number one fear, rejection. I think if you trace back really the root of every human fear, I think rejection is going to be somewhere involved in that. Because nobody wants to get shut down. Nobody wants to get rejected. And that's why so many of us, we, we don't witness this because it's like, well, what if people don't get it? What if people think I'm judging them? What if people think I'm being too pushy, too forward? You know, I, I don't want to experience that rejection. But listen, what if instead of living in fear of being rejected, we lived in anticipation of when somebody responds and says, oh my, I've never heard of this Jesus before. You're, you're telling me he died for my sins. You're telling me that he's given me a new identity. You're telling me that now I was once lost and going to hell and now I'm going to heaven. That's what you're telling me? And if we would just live in this anticipation that people would experience that. That, that we would have far fewer people that are afraid to share their faith. And we'd have more people say, hey, listen, I might get rejected 10 times, but for the one time that I smell like life to somebody, it's all worth it. It's all worth it for me to lead that one person to Jesus. I don't, I'm, I'm not worried about all the rejections. I'm more concerned with who could I lead through the power of the Holy Spirit to the throne room of God, into the family of heaven. And listen, here's what I think about it. it Jesus is such good news, y'all. It's the gospel. This is it, and what does that word mean? If you break it down, it means good news. This is, and it's not just the good news, it's the best news ever. And so, listen, why, why would we keep it to ourselves? I almost think of it just from a logical standpoint. When you know something good about something, you're going to talk about it. It's like, y'all, last summer, I think it was, I just, like, think about it. Have you ever just had some amazing food? I'm just going to relate it to food because that's my favorite thing. So have you ever just had some incredible food and you're just like, bro, I got to tell everybody about this? I can't just keep this to myself. Like, how could I possibly not share it? 
You know, last summer I had a, a friend of mine, actually they go to church here, Matthew and Kendra Kreider, uh, awesome people, but they, uh, Matthew told me about this donut burger, which how many of you just upon hearing that, would you eat it? Let me just see some honest people, you would, you would eat that. Now how many of you are like gross, that's disgusting, I would never eat it. Like, you know, the sweet and the savory, you know, combination, I understand that's not for everybody. Uh, but man, when he told me about it, I got excited. Like I, my mouth started watering just right then and there as he told me about it. But anyway, so we just continued talking about it. And then finally for his birthday last year, we we went, uh, me and, and Ryan and Taylor and uh, and the two of them. So Madison wasn't there, there so I fifth wheeled, but that's okay. Uh, we had a good time anyway. But we went to this place and, and I finally got to partake in what he had been telling me about for a few months. And let me tell you, it did not disappoint. It did not disappoint even a little bit. Listen, it's called Cypress Street Pint and Plate, okay? So I want you guys to punch that in your GPS and go there for dinner tonight because it is amazing, okay? And eat the donut burger even if you're nervous about it, even if you don't think it sounds good. I'm telling you, it'll change your life. But anyway, once I got to partake in it, it's like now I was telling everybody that I knew about it. I was like, this is so amazing. You got to try it. Go to this place, you know, and I don't even know if it was expensive. I'm pretty sure it was like 20 bucks. I don't care. It was amazing. And so I'm just going, I'm going public with this thing, with this donut burger that I got to eat. And for for you, it might be, I don't know, Nancy's Pizza. Ever, anybody ever been there? Some good stuff, I tell you what. You know, it might be Red Lobster to you, I don't know, but whatever it is that you find amazing, you, you tend to share about it because it's something you're passionate about. Maybe it's not food for you, maybe it's gadgets, maybe it's sports, I don't know, whatever it is that fill in the blank for your passion, but we tend to talk about what matters most to us. Amen? We tend to talk about what matters most. So, so if we're going to be so passionate about these things, and listen, I, food's great, but it's not going to send me to heaven. And all these other things we talk about, we're so bold and passionate to share about. Listen, none of that is changing anyone's life. But Jesus, see, he has the power to bring us from death to life. He has the power to restore what was lost. He has the power to bring us back into a relationship with him. And why do I say bring us back? It's because our sin got in the way and it separated us from him. But because of what Jesus has done, now we have been brought back to the Father, presented as holy in his sight, and now we get a new name and a new identity and it's child of God. And when we can help other people know that, listen, how could we possibly keep it to ourselves? How could we possibly keep that contained inside? Everyone needs to know. Everyone needs to experience his goodness just as we have. Listen, salvation, in order for salvation to come to any heart, it requires a human witness. And I want, you know, some of you might be thinking, well, no, God just, he can just reveal himself to us and, and we can get saved that way. And listen, I understand that that's part of it. But I, I guarantee you, I want you in, in this room, I want you to think back about the moment you got saved. I guarantee you, most of us in here, you can remember it. How many, raise your hand if you remember the moment that you went from death to life. You remember when he called you by name and how everything changed for you. I guarantee you, most of you in here remember that. Even if you were a little kid, four or five, I, I was young. I used to get saved every week in kids' ministry. Every week. Anybody else? Every week, I'm telling you. I, you know, they tell my parents, like, he got saved again. And they're like, okay, well, thank God. Praise the Lord, he got saved again. <laughs> but I was, I was that kid. And so, you know, I, I can't remember the specific moment. And I love hearing people that can remember that, that exact moment. Maybe they were a little older. Maybe they were in their, their teen years. They're in their 20s, 30s. Some people get saved, you know, a few years before they go to heaven. You know, and it's an it's amazing thing no matter when it happens. But I just want us to, to think about that moment, I guarantee you we can trace it back, of course, to the glory of God, but you can trace it back to a person. It may be a pastor, a youth pastor, a teacher, a coach, a parent. You know, it, whenever anybody gives their life to Jesus, there's people, a, a group of people that play a part in that happening. But that's, and the, and the reason that is, is because salvation must be witnessed in order to be experienced. It must be something that we share, that we are bold to talk about. You know, if we're not pouring into people, how are they ever going to give their lives to Jesus? If we're not talking about how amazing and how good and how faithful he is, then how will people ever say, you know what, that's something I need in my life. I, I know I'm not going in the right direction. Even if everything seems like everything's great and just amazing in their lives, it's like, whoa, there's something missing though. There's a, there's a God-sized hole in my heart that I didn't even know that I had that I can only fill with his presence and his glory. 
And so we have to be bold and, and, and witness to people. That's the only way that people give their lives over to Jesus. It requires our participation. And listen, don't think that it's all dependent on you. It's completely dependent on the Holy Spirit, but it requires your yes and your obedience. And so we must step out in faith and trust that the Holy Spirit would use us as the agents through which salvation is received by humanity. Romans 10, 14 says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? How, how, so, in other words, how are people going to know unless we talk about it? Listen, we got, we got to don't just talk about it, be about it, but also be about it and talk about it. Do both of it, right? And that's how people come to know Jesus is through us declaring, declaring his glory. And so, listen, his glory, like I said, it doesn't shift based on our willingness to participate and, and declare it. But what happens is it introduces others to his glory, and if we keep quiet about it, other people can't be introduced to his glory. It, I'm, I, we have to say yes. We have to know our role in this and understand it's not dependent on us, but it does require our participation. Listen, Jesus is no longer walking the earth. He's, he's where? He's seated at the right hand of the throne of the Father. And the Holy Spirit lives inside of each of us as believers. And so when we walk in obedience with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will use us He'll use our boldness. He'll use our yes so that other people can know him too. And then they can go and make disciples. See, this whole, this whole salvation thing, is it's, it just keeps on going. It's a ripple effect. It doesn't stop. It doesn't end. As long as the body of Christ steps up and does what we're called to do from the moment we say yes to Jesus, you become a missionary. You become someone who, who witnesses. You become someone who shares Regardless if you have any experience or not, listen, you just got to trust that the Lord is going to give you what you need to say. That's why so many of us, you know, we're, we don't do it or we're too afraid to do it is because we don't think that we're going to have the right things to say, you know, that we're not going to do it right. It's like, Kayla, you, you don't understand. I don't know anything about the Bible. God does. He'll, he'll show you. If you just open up his word and you trust him to show you what you need to see and, and reveal things to you and, and give you that boldness, give you those words, listen, if you just trust him, you can trust that he's going he's gonna to make it happen through you, through your obedience. And so don't be worried about saying all the right things, doing all the right things. Just trust he's going to lead you to do it. And so some of us, we think, oh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say too much or I'm going to say too little. You know, like have you, you've heard of those people that, you know, they, they witness to others and, you know, they, they get a little pushy about it. You know, maybe you've been that person before, you know, like it's just like you need Jesus. You don't even understand. You need him. And then others of us are like, well, you know, you can take him if you want him. You know, he's, he's, he's okay, I guess. You know, it's just like two opposite ends of the spectrum uh, when it comes to witnessing. You, see, you know, you don't want to be that person that pushes them so hard that you push them away. And then they're like, I don't want to be a part of this whole family of God thing. If this is what the Christians are like, I'm good. You know, and then the other side of it is, you know, are you really even saying anything at all? Are you agreeing so much to the point that, that people are like, well, are they even passionate about this Jesus guy? Like, they're telling me I need to follow him, but they're, are they even passionate about it, you know? And so there, there's kind of two ends of the spectrum there, but there's, a, there's middle ground that we can find to, to say the right things. And, and listen, really, that's just, that's just where we just have to trust God. Because some of us, our personality is we're so passionate that it's like you might push somebody over the edge. And then the, on the flip side, it's like some of us are the personality where it's just like, you know, did I even say enough? But, but when we just trust God and we, we lean on him in all of this, see, the Bible says lean not on your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge him, and he will show you what path to take. He'll show you what to say, what to do, what to think. He will make all of that clear for you. I love that about God. That he doesn't leave us in the dark. He doesn't leave us confused or wondering. He shows us how to do it. And what, what, what better way to understand how to do it than just by reading his word and, and seeing how people did it in the Bible. And see, listen, we, we need to be able to know and tell the difference between people that are ready to be witnessed to and people that aren't. And this is kind of going to go back to the scripture that we read a minute ago, is that some people, I want you to think about an apple. This would have been better if I would have actually brought an apple up here. But pretend there's an apple in my hand. Think about a red apple is ripe, right? You know, you, you want to eat a red apple. It's good stuff. But then you got a green apple that might not be ripe yet. I know, like, you got the Granny Smith, and those are good. But, you know, a, a red apple that's not quite ripe yet might be 
might be green. Or, you know, a banana that's not ripe yet, that's also green. You know, I don't know what it is about green and not being ripe, but I guess that's how it works. But I want you to think about, you got the red apple and you got the green apple. The red apple is ready, right? They're ready to receive and fulfill their purpose. And so, you know, we go and we, we minister to a red apple and they receive it. And it's like, yes, they, they received the goodness of God. It's such a good feeling. You know, they, they experience his glory. It's amazing. I got to be a part of it. Go me, self high five, you know, whatever. But then you got on the flip side, it's like, what about the green apples that we, that we minister to? And they're not ready to receive it yet. And they shut us down. I just, just by a show of hands, I just want y'all to be bold real quick. Has anybody in here ever tried to witness to somebody and got shut down? You can, yeah. Okay, so a lot of us. It's just like, no, they, they didn't receive it. Nothing to do with you, but they just, they weren't ready. They weren't ready to receive the glory. And listen, that doesn't mean you did anything wrong. It just means that they, they weren't ready. It wasn't the right time, you know? And so we, we have to understand that it has to be the right time in order for somebody to be that red apple that is ready to receive the knowledge of the glory of God. They, they have to be ready for it. You can't just bring that to somebody that's, that's not ready because they're not going to receive it. It doesn't mean we don't do it. It just means that sometimes we're going to experience the green apple. And don't go, you know, if somebody shuts you down when you're trying to evangelize to them, don't just be like, you're a green apple, and then just walk away because they're going to be like, what? And they might punch you, so don't do that. But, you know, you, you think to yourself, it's just like, mm, they just weren't ready. And listen, that's, that's the hard part. That's the challenging thing is just it being the right time and, and us saying the right thing at the right time and it being well received. See, listen, I'm right now in the throes of parenting a two-year-old. Saying the right thing at the right time is, is a really hard thing for me, especially my personality, y'all. Like, I don't know if anybody else disciplines or did discipline their kids like this, but, you know, he's two. Two years old, he doesn't understand when I talk to him for more than five seconds. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, you know, he's, let's just say he's pulling on the curtains or whatever. And I'm like, Kyler, you know, get down to his level. Like, hey, buddy, you shouldn't pull on the curtains because when you do that, it might pull down the curtain rod, and that could land on your head, and that's not going to be good because then you might have to go to the hospital, and then it's going to get the house all dirty, and so that's just really not a good idea. Do you think he understands a word I just said? He's just like, ha <laughs> daddy, and then runs off. <laughs> and meanwhile, my wife, you know, she's, she gets it more than I do, obviously. She's like, you know, he's doing he's something he shouldn't do, and she's like, Kyler, no, sir, let's go play. You know, and he's like, okay, mommy, and then runs off, and he goes and plays, and he's good. It's all about redirecting their focus, getting their attention off of what they're doing that they shouldn't be doing and putting it on something that they can do. But I'm, I'm just like, no, i got to give him a speech. He needs to understand the error of his ways. He needs to understand why he messed up, you know, and just... And I'm just, you know, it never works. It, it never, ever works. So if you have a toddler or you are you know, got a baby that's going to become a toddler, then let me just give you a word of advice there. Don't give them a speech. They're just going to look at you, and they're not going to get it. So, But saying the right thing at the right time, you know, when he's 10 years old, 12 years old, you know, sometimes it's later for certain kids. Maybe when they're 18, maybe then they'll get the speech. And all the parents of teenagers are like, nope, they still don't get it. <laughs> but... You know, maybe, maybe later on they'll be better equipped to receive what I'm saying, but when I'm talking to a two-year-old, they're not going to get it. And so you have to communicate differently. And it's kind of in the same way. You Listen, all kind, there's all kinds of people out there in the world, all different personalities, all different ways of receiving things, of understanding things, of processing things. And so that means that what you say to person A might not be received the same way by person B. And I think that's where we, we make it complicated. It's like, well, there's, there's just too many people and there's too many, you know, different ways of processing and understanding and that's just too much pressure. What if I say the same thing every time and it's just received differently every time? Listen, don't let that fear stop you from doing what you're called to do. Listen, don't, don't be afraid of people not understanding. Don't, don't be afraid of the green apples stop you from getting to the red apples. Because there's people out there that are going to receive what you're saying and you're going to get to lead them to Jesus. And what an amazing feeling that that is. But don't, don't let the fear of smelling like death prevent you from smelling like life to other people. Listen, we cannot let this, this fear get in our way and cripple us from doing what we're called to do. Just going back up to the passage we started off with. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved 
and among those that are perishing. So you don't, listen, you don't just give off an, a, an aroma to people that are being saved. You also give off one to, to people that are perishing, to people that don't get it, the people that aren't ready to receive it. So either way, you're putting off a smell, but to some people it's going to be well received and to others it's not. And we, we, the reason that so many of us don't step out and evangelize and be who we're called to be is because we're afraid of stinking. But if you're, if you're so afraid of that, you're never going to get to the people that you smell good to, that are going to receive the gospel, that are going to receive your message. And so we can't be crippled by this fear of, of you know, being, putting off this aroma, whether it's good or bad. Listen, some people are going to think you smell good, and, you know, listen, I think, you know, we're going to smell like heaven. Heaven probably smells like Chick-fil-A. That's just my guess, you know. And, and so to some people, you know, we're, we're going to smell great, and then other people, you know, think of whatever it is that smells bad to you. You know, that's what you're going to smell like, and I don't mean just because you didn't put on, be, uh, you know, deodorant this morning. I'm talking about just because you love Jesus, and some people just don't get it, and they're not going to like that. It's not going to make sense to them. And so we can't live in fear. We can't live in fear. We can't be afraid of what people might think. Listen, the, honestly, I'd say probably the number one thing that stops us from becoming who we're called to be is we're afraid of what everybody else might think. We're afraid of what everybody else might think if, if we just step out in boldness, if we just be the people that we're called to be. We're, just, we're afraid of, of what it might look like. Going back up to verse 17. It says, for we are not like so many peddlers of God's word. That word peddlers right there means like door-to-door sales person. That's a peddler, right? So we're not just peddlers of God's word, but we are men of sincerity. We're genuine. As commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. So as we speak in sincerity and boldness, as commissioned by God, we, we are just fulfilling the purpose that he gave us. We're not just making this up. It, I believe there's a reason that it's the last thing Jesus said before he went to heaven. It, that was it, and then he, he ascended, and he's been there ever since. What did he leave us with, with? He said, you go out and make disciples. You will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Basically, what Jesus is saying is, hey, there's other people that need this, and you need to reach those people. You need to make sure that they experience my glory just as you have. And here's a quote that I know is going to challenge a lot of us in here, but it's something that needs to be said. This is in a book that I read, actually, over the summer. And it just stuck with me. And it's that every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Yeah, you guys have the same reaction I did. I read that and I'm like, Lord, forgive me. I'm a sinner. Give me the spirit of boldness. I'm too ashamed. And, you know, just, just crying out because genuinely that's, that's the reality is that if we're not bold and we're not talking about how amazing this God that we serve is, if we're not open about it, it doesn't make us any less saved. It just makes us all the, the, the least amount impactful. We're just, you can be saved and not make an impact. And that's what many Christians do is we're just afraid to share, and so we, we don't make an impact because we're afraid of what others might think. And so what we need to witness well, the number one thing that's going to prevent us from being an imposter and help us to fulfill being a missionary, the number one thing we need is boldness. Boldness. Everybody say boldness. Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth, to Villa Rica, Georgia. You will be my witnesses to Carrollton, Georgia, to Bremen, Georgia, to everywhere that we occupy. We will be his witnesses. And how does that happen? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. Not because you're just so awesome, and you are. You're cool. But listen, we need the power of the Holy Spirit to make an impact. How can we make a difference without him? And so boldness is not a personality type. Don't ever think that boldness is a personality type. It's just like, well, you know, I'm kind of on the quiet side, so, you know, I'm I'm not really bold. Listen, boldness has got nothing to do with how talkative you are. It's got everything to do with how okay are you with being uncomfortable. Are you okay with being uncomfortable if it means God gets glory? Are you okay with other people not getting you if it means that God gets the glory? Is that something you can live with? Because that's what boldness is. It's a decision to be uncomfortable if it means that God's kingdom is extended. If it means that Jesus gets more glory. 
And I want you to think about boldness for a second in the Bible. Who's the boldest person in the Bible? Let's just answer that real quick. His name starts with a J and it ends in Jesus. There you go, Jesus. The boldest person who ever lived, right? Everything he did challenged the status quo of his day. Didn't it, Miss Katie? Everything he did, everything he said. Listen, he had scripture debates with the religious leaders who were supposed to be the experts. And he said, no, 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 y'all don't get it. Y'all don't get it. Let me, let me tell you how it is. Let me tell you as the son of God, which that was, he said that, and whoo, man, they got riled up. They did not like that. And he was telling them, hey, no, this is how to best follow God. He hung out with the lowest of society. Think about whoever that is in your mind. And listen, I know we all want to be like, well, we're all God's children and we're all amazing and we're all great. But listen, I know that people come to your mind, certain types or groups of people, you know, that we would consider the lowest or the least privileged, the marginalized, right? Listen, he hung out with those people more than he did anybody else. Way more than he hung out with religious people. So listen, he was okay with being bold because listen, the religious leaders, they looked at him, they didn't like it. It It's like, what are you doing hanging out with all these sinners? And he said, it's not the healthy that need a doctor, it's the sick. I, I gotta hang out with the people that don't know Jesus so that I can help them get well, so that I can help them know who he is and, and give their lives to him and be forever changed, be brought into eternal wellness. He performed miracles that no one had ever seen. So do you think for one second that Jesus was ever shy about his mission? Y'all, he walked up into the temple and just started flipping tables. I mean, that dude did not care. He just did his thing. He just fulfilled his heavenly purpose. And he was bold. And this is what he had to say about boldness in Matthew 5, 14 through 16. He said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. That's what Jesus had to say about boldness. He said, hey, you're the light of the world. Well, so just a couple things we can gather from that passage is, first of all, that we're the light of the world, you and I. Look at your neighbor and say, you're the light. And I want you to understand, Jesus said this very same statement about himself. He said, I'm the light of the world. But then what, what does he say? Later on, he said, or it might have been earlier on, I don't know where that is in the Bible, but he said, you're the light of the world. So if he said it about himself and he said it about us, what does that say about how he sees us? It doesn't mean that we're his equals, but it means that we can make the same impact he did. Jesus himself even said this. He said, you will do as I did and even greater. Even greater things. It doesn't mean you're greater than me. It just means that you're gonna make a greater impact because Jesus, you know, he, he mostly just reached that one region that he lived in. You and I, we're all, the church is a global thing. It's a global movement. And so us right here in West Georgia and then other churches all across the country and the world, we can make the same impact he did in our regions and therefore make a bigger impact. So we're the light of the world. And then the world is dark. Listen, there would be no need for light if there wasn't darkness. And listen, we can't just expect that, well, you know, the light will just you know, reveal itself and the world will become brighter because of that. And you know, the Holy Spirit, he's got this. And yes, he does, but he's gonna use you and me to do it. And so the world, yes, there's, there's darkness in the world, but eventually Jesus will come and he'll, he'll sort out the darkness. But listen, the more you and I say yes to our, our, our calling and we're obedient, the less dark it's gonna be. The more we're gonna see light take, take over the darkness. And listen, it doesn't mean that there's not gonna be any more darkness. Still, the majority of the world does not call themselves a Christian, so there's still darkness out there. But the more you and I witness the people and we begin to depopulate hell and populate heaven, we're fulfilling our impact. We're, we're making a difference. Even if you feel like you're not, even if you feel like, well, you know, I, that, you know, I, I just encountered 20 green apples and, and they all got mad at me for talking about Jesus. And you're just like, am I really making a difference? You don't know what kind of seeds you're planting. That's what we gotta remember is that even when people reject us, even if they say no and no, this isn't for me, you don't know if they might come circle back around to it three years later and think about, man, remember when that person was just bold and just talked about their faith and, 
and, and I just, man, I want to know more about that. And then they go, they go find a local church that they go to on a Sunday morning, and they get saved. They give their lives to Jesus all because you planted a seed three, four, five, ten years earlier. What an amazing thing that we get to be a part of. And see, listen, when we recognize all these, these truths, it burrs inside of us a mission to go out and be the light of the world. And I want you to think about if you lived with this mindset every single day, if I don't shine for his glory, who will? What if you asked yourself that question every single day? If, if I'm not going to shine, who, who will? I'm not waiting on everybody else to do it. I got to do it myself. The world needs to experience his light, and I'm not just waiting on everybody else to step up to the plate and be who they're called to be. It starts with me. What if we all had that mindset, living in anticipation of what God will do, and we say to ourselves, it starts with me. Listen, I pray that the whole church gets on board with this mission, but if, even if they don't, it starts with me. I'm going to be who I'm called to be. I'm going to go out, and I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to go out, and I'm going to show the world the love of Jesus. And if we wake up every morning and start our days with that question, if I don't shine, who will? Then it's going to enable us to step out in boldness and just go and witness. And we're going to start finding that we're less and less shy about it, but instead we're just more concerned with who might come into the family of God. What brothers and sisters in Christ might I gain if I just be who I'm called to be and I share his love with everyone? Here's what Jesus had to say about the harvest. Matthew 9, 37 through 38. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out, <clears throat> excuse me, to send out laborers into his harvest. So listen, there's no shortage of harvest. That's not the problem. The harvest is out there. Listen, the church is still growing. Can I give you some good news for just a second? The church is growing. Disciples are being made. There's revi worldwide revival all over the planet. We are seeing people come to Jesus in droves and numbers that have not been seen for, for hundreds of years. Can I Come on, can we get excited about that? The church, the body of Christ is expanding. You and I are a part of something so much bigger than ourselves. And that's, that's good news to be a part of. But yet there's still a shortage of laborers. The only reason that we don't see more revival, more churches planted, more salvations, is because we need more laborers to say yes and take their place. More Christians who would not be private Christians or Christians in name only. I call them nominal Christians. Just like, yeah, I, I say yes, I believe in Jesus, but I don't take it with me. I leave it at church on Sunday mornings. I leave it at home when I go to work in the morning. I leave it at home when I go to school in the morning. Yeah, I call myself a Christian. I'm going to heaven, but I'm not making an impact. Man, let that not be said of the body of Christ. Now, let that not be said of this house. Let that not be said of any house that calls Jesus Lord. May we be the ones that we, we read this scripture and it breaks our hearts because Jesus, even in his day, recognized that the laborers were few. But what if he would look down on his church today and say the laborers are no longer few. They're going out and they're fulfilling their kingdom purpose. They're being who they're called to be. They're taking my message with them everywhere that they go. Come on, somebody. They're, they're taking me public. They're not keeping me under a lampstand, but in Instead, they are boldly declaring the goodness and the glory of God everywhere that they go. And the laborers are increasing in number. More of an impact is being made because people are saying yes, yes, yes. And they are witnessing like we've never seen before. The glory of God is going into more places because of the bold witnesses that are saying yes. So as we close here, I want to ask you, a few questions. I want you to write these down. Think about them this week. Number one, where's my boldness level? Where's my boldness level? Where am I at with boldness? Am I walking in boldness at all? Am I concerned with smelling like death to people that is preventing me from smelling like life to those who are ready to receive the gospel? Where's your concern with that? Are you afraid of what everyone else might think? I want you to figure out what's holding you back from living as a witness of King Jesus day in and day out. And I want you to rearrange your priorities. Take, take out whatever needs to be removed, put in whatever needs to be put into place, and find out what it is you need to do. 
in order for you to go out and start making an impact and witnessing like never before. I mean, I, here's, here's my prayer, is that we would just be able to walk into, I don't know, Walmart and walk down an aisle and we see somebody standing a few feet away from us and the Holy Spirit just drops a word on our heart for them. Can you imagine? I mean, just the impact that would be made if, if we would just listen to the Holy Spirit. You know, this is something I learned about a few years ago with YWAM, actually, uh, Nicholas and Cassidy, where they came from and something, it, it changed my life. It really did. And I, I'll be honest, even today, I wish I did it more, that I would just go out into public and just think about, just listen to the Holy Spirit. What if we went everywhere just trying to listen to the Holy Spirit on behalf of other people? And listen, that is probably one of the most uncomfortable things that, that some of us will do. It's just like, you're, you're telling me you want me to go just talk to a stranger and tell them what God said about them? What? Like, are you kidding? That is, that's terrifying. I'm never gonna do that. But then as we just trust God, and trust that, yeah, listen, we might do it sometimes and, and we might get rejected. I mean, you've been rejected a few times, I'm sure, haven't you? And just, and I know, listen, for me, when I did it, I got rejected. There were a few green apples in there, but then there's some people that are ripe and ready to receive the gospel. And there is nothing like speaking to them, praying with them, encouraging them, showing them the goodness of God just through our obedience. There's nothing like it. And so if we live in such a way that even out in public, even out just doing the most mundane of things, of how we can just make the biggest impact just by simply being aware of what the Spirit wants to do and what He wants to say, there's nothing like it. So ask yourself, where is your boldness level? How bold are you willing to be for the kingdom? Number two, if I'm already witnessing, how is it being received? Think about your witnessing strategy. What are you saying? What are you, what are you doing? How, how are people receiving your witness? Are you being gentle and patient? Or are you being overbearing and pushy, saying, you need Jesus. If you don't receive him, you might not go to heaven. And so you need him. And listen, people are going to run. They don't want that. Don't be that person. We've all met that person. Don't be that person. <laughs> But then what if, what if you're the one that is loving and gentle and patient and kind, and even if they don't, even if they reject you, even if you smell like death to them, you're just like, that's okay. Not in a condescending way, but just like, in a, that's okay. Not everybody's gonna get it. That's okay, Lord, just continue to lead me to those that are ripe and ready to receive the gospel. I don't care if I have to encounter 50 green apples before I get to that red one, I'm just gonna be obedient. And ask yourself, how am I communicating? When I get that opportunity, am I being gentle and loving and kind and patient with people? Because the Bible tells us to do, to speak the truth in love. To speak the truth in love. We can't stop and just speak the truth. Well, I told them the truth. I might have been mean as a snake as I did it, but I told them the truth. Doesn't matter what I said, if I was a jerk to them, but listen, if we would speak the truth in love and in patience, the Bible says everything is summed up in love. Everything we need to communicate to other people can be summed up if we just say, Lord, help me to have a loving and gentle tone as I, as I speak with anyone, especially regarding the gospel. And so speak the truth in love. And so if you're witnessing, just make sure it's being received in a gentle way. And just even sometimes you speak gently, people won't respond gently. I don't know if any of you guys that raised your hand a minute ago and said that you've been rejected sharing the gospel, you might have been as patient and loving and gentle as ever, and they still start barking at you when you did it. They, that may have happened, and people might respond that way sometimes, but it should not hold us back from speaking and witnessing to people. And then last question, is my life pointing to the King of glory? Listen, we've been talking about glory all month long how to live in his glory, how to experience his glory, how to carry and distribute his glory. Is your life pointing in the direction of the king of glory? Because if it's not, you're gonna have a hard time witnessing to people. If it's not pointing to him, if you just think about like a, a compass, right? It goes wherever it's pointing. Is your compass pointed toward Jesus? So that when people look at you, they see that the direction you're moving in is not one of your own personal gain or anyone else or the culture, the society, that you were pointed toward Jesus. And that when people look at your life, they say, that, that person, they might not even know who it is, but they know you're running after something that's worth running after. Just like his, his goodness runs after us, may we run after his goodness. And let, let our lives point in the direction of, of who he is, of his nature. And so make sure that we are giving God his 
do praise. And I want you to remember this statement. The appropriate response to salvation, when we said yes to Jesus, the appropriate response to that, freely given to us, is unashamed witness of the majesty of King Jesus. Whew, I know that's a mouthful. I'm going to say it one more time. The appropriate response to salvation freely given to us, you didn't do anything to earn it. You didn't do anything to deserve it. It was just given to you as a free gift, is unashamed witness of the majesty of King Jesus. Unashamed. Unashamed. Listen, the book of if you go read the book of Acts, the early church, I want you to think about how unashamed they were. Listen, knowing that they could be killed, they could be taken out for what they said, jailed for for and listen, most of them were. Think about Stephen. Think about all of the disciples except for one. They were all martyred for their faith. And the one that wasn't martyred was cast into exile. So listen, back in that day and even still today, it might look different, but but being bold and open about our faith is not always well received and people aren't going to get it. And to to the early church, they killed him for it. But I love what Peter said here in Acts chapter four, verses eight through 13. This encourages me to be bolder than ever, just reading this passage. If you ever feel your boldness waning, go back and read what Peter had to say right here. Chapter four, verses eight through 13. Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, couldn't have done it without the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. So they're giving Jesus all the glory and all the praise. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is no other name. Now when they saw the boldness, say boldness, of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Wow. Uneducated common men. Listen, you don't have to be a Bible scholar to be a witness. You don't have to be a theologian to be a witness. You don't have to be the guy with the mic on the platform to be a witness. You just have to be available. That's all you need right there. You want the ingredient for going out and witnessing for the kingdom of God? Just say yes. Just be available. Just say, Lord, I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll I'll, I'll be sent out to wherever you would have me go. I'll say whatever it is you want me to say. I just give you my yes to going out and changing the world, to evangelizing to a world that is dark, that needs your glory, that needs your power, that needs salvation. I'll say yes. I'll be a part of it. If no one else will, I will. I'm not going to hold back. I'm going to go all in for you because there is a world that needs to experience your glory. And I'm not going to stand by while no one else participates. I'm going to go out and I'm going to change the world for you, Jesus. Just say yes, church. Just say yes. Don't let fear hold you back. You go out and you be who you're called to be. I want to challenge you as we close, as we get ready to go back into this song. I want you to think about someone in your life that needs a bold witness of Jesus. I guarantee you there's there's people coming into your mind all across this room, people who need the glory of God in their lives. It's not that you're looking down and judging them. It's just that, listen, they, they need something that you have. Listen, if we say, if we've called upon the name of Jesus, which most of us in here have, we have access to something that the world needs. We have access to the glory of God and other people need it. You can't find this anywhere else. What we're experiencing right now in this room, this this amazing glory of God, this communion of the saints, you can't get this elsewhere. You can't get this at a at, you know at a Justin Bieber concert. You can't get this at school. You can't get this, you know, out at your favorite restaurant. You can only get this right here in the family of God with believers and with the glory of God. And that's what other people need, whether they realize it or not. So I want you to think about some people or maybe even just one person that you could witness to or that you could plant a seed of salvation. I want you to just write their name down. Maybe just write there on your phone, maybe on a piece of paper. But I want you to just think about think of that person or those people and write their names down and ask that God would give you the opportunity to witness to them. And if not you, then someone. Sometimes the greatest prayer we can pray for someone is not necessarily that we witness to them, but that somebody does. Because that person you're thinking of might live across the country. 
might live far away where you don't really get to do life with them day in and day out, but you can pray, Lord Jesus, send someone their way that is going to lead them to your glory. If, even if it's not me, you know, you can send texts and you can make calls and you can do all that. But listen, pray that someone would show up and be present in their lives to lead them into a relationship with Jesus. It's an amazing thing to be a part of. So I want you to think about that they would be those red apples, that you would smell like life to them and they'd be ripe and ready to receive the gospel. That's, that's my prayer. That's my cry for us today is that we would just be aware of the world around us that doesn't know Jesus because sometimes we can just get lost in our Christian bubbles and just, well, everybody I know is already saved, so I guess this is a message for everybody else. If everyone you know is saved, you need to start hanging out with other people. Start hanging out with some unsaved people. That's what Jesus did. And, and as a result, everyone that he met received salvation because they knew who he was. And so that's my prayer is that we would just begin to get uncomfortable and be bold so that other people may experience the glory of God, so that, the hev so that heaven may become more populated so that we can make more of an impact and a difference in the world around us. So would you bow your heads and close your eyes right where you're at? And I just want to pray a bold prayer over you. And Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you so much for just joining with us today. Thank you for this word. Thank you for this message to impact the world around us for the glory of God. God, we understand we don't exist for us. We are here for you, and we're here for the people that don't know you. And so, Lord, would you just make us aware of the people around us that need your glory, need your light, need your love? And would you help us to just say yes and be a part of the salvation story of someone else so that your glory may come down to earth? And so, Lord, just make us bold for you. Make us bold as we read your word, as we gather with the saints, Lord, as we go out into our communities, into grocery stores, into schools, into the park, wherever it is that we go, that we would just be carriers of your glory, living in anticipation of who needs this, who needs what I have, that their lives may be forever changed. And so, Lord, just we need your glory. We need it. Come and help us to be bold witnesses for your kingdom. We thank you for it. And so, Lord, right now, if there's anybody in here that needs to make a decision for Jesus as we get ready to go back into a response time, I just want to give you the opportunity to say yes to him. If you've never made that decision before, if you need, you, you say, you know, all this, this is great, and I want to be a witness, but I need to experience him for myself first. If you're in here and you need Jesus to be your personal Lord and Savior, I want to give you the chance to make that decision. You say, I just want to be forgiven of my sins, and I want to make sure that when I die, I will see Jesus face to face. So if you're in here, no one else is looking around. This is a moment just between you and the Holy Spirit. I just want to give you the chance to be bold. Sometimes for some of you, boldness is going to start right here. Before it ever starts out there, it's going to start right here. You just say, I need Jesus. I need a relationship with him. If that's you in this room, on the count of three, I just want you to raise your hand, put it right back down. So I just want to know that I'm praying with you. One, two, three. Three. Anybody in here that needs Jesus, maybe for the first time, or maybe you just need to come back to him. If you just want to rededicate your life to him, I see your hand. Thank you. Anybody else want to join in with these others? Make, give your life over to Jesus, maybe for the first time, or, or maybe you just want to come back to him. Amen. Lord Jesus, you see these hands and these hearts, and Lord, I just pray right now that we would be the people that go out into the harvest. But God, that we would be the laborers, that we would go out and make a difference, make an impact for the kingdom of God. And we thank you for the salvations that are happening even in this room right now. God, I thank you that you are forgiving us of our sins. God, everything we've ever done wrong, anything we'll ever do wrong, God, is washed away right now. And we have been reconciled to God through what Jesus did for us on the cross. We thank you so much for your love. We thank you for saving us so that we may see you face to face one day. God, we love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. Amen. Come on.